So now we we are ready to start. So I, it's really a big pleasure for me to introduce you, Laura Pexet. This is not only Laura Pexet. Tell me all the name. Yeah. Laura Leal Tashe. Leal Tashe. So I say, I'm so sorry. I never been able to pronounce it, her surname. So Laura, it's a perfect for me. Uh, Laura, uh, she was a, a researcher and professor at University in Munich until a few months ago, actually. Now she moved uh, in NVIDIA, in NVIDIA Research Lab here in Italy. So it's uh, fantastic for us to, to know that uh, also NVIDIA now investing uh, in, in research in Italy. And she is also a recipient of uh, a ERC starting grant for uh, a topic that probably she will talk with us about that. And as well as uh, I, I said you, uh, she's uh, also a fellow of Inelis and is one of the most expert that we have in the world uh, about uh, people uh, analysis tracking uh, computer vision in video, at least uh, the one that I know. <laughs> so that is a, a fantastic opportunity for me to have you and to share their, uh, their knowledge and their idea and, uh, and some word with that. And in front of you, you have uh, many of uh, our PhD students in our school uh, in Modena and also of the National PhD School uh, in, the, in AI, some of them coming from there. Uh, other people are connected to us and uh, if it's okay for you, we register that in order to share also for the students that we will have in the second semester for computer vision, so mm -hmm. that is uh, something that is useful for that. So thank you very, very much, Laura, to be here. Thanks, Rita, for the kind introduction and thanks for the invitation. So I'm really happy to be here. And uh, today I will talk about multi-object tracking, maybe unsurprisingly, because I've been working on this for like more than a decade now. And so just so that I understand a little bit what's the background here, um, who is actively working on tracking for their research or their jobs? OK, only two. OK, that's awesome. Great. Three, three, four. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, some people, some people. Okay, but then you can sleep then for the first half of the presentation um, because I wanted to give sort of a broad introduction to everyone. Um, so you do need a little bit of computer vision, deep learning background, but hopefully I will get you excited about multi object tracking, which is a topic that I really like. So I will start from the beginning, going all the way to exciting stuff, for example, using transformers for multi object tracking. But the beginning will be more about the topic, more about what has been done um, until uh, this end-to-end -end learning, deep learning for tracking, which is pretty much what everyone is talking about right now. So as uh, Rita said, I recently joined NVIDIA, but this work was mostly done at TUM. And so let's, let's get started. So what is the topic that I'm going to talk about today? Uh, Multi-object tracking in which you see here an example, a couple of scenes that we usually work on. Um, and the goal is actually to detect and track every object in this scene. Usually we detect and track people because um, these are the most interesting objects that we can follow. They have nice interactions, they move around with their own will. So actually tracking them is quite challenging. And so given a video, we want to find which parts of the image depict the same object in different frames. This is kind of the formal definition. And so since this is quite a hard problem to start with, what we have been doing for the past, I would say, 20 years has been uh, using detectors as starting points. So first you detect the objects in a scene and then you track them or you associate them over time. So one question that you might ask is, OK, why do we actually need tracking? Why do we care about multi-object tracking? Well, first of all, um, detection has its own problems, right? There are occlusions, there are viewpoint changes that might um, make detectors suffer a little bit in certain conditions. Post changes, blurring, illumination variation, all of this uh, makes the detector suffer in, in certain conditions. Also, when there's background clutter, for example, and so for all of these cases, when the detector doesn't work, we're hoping that the tracker will actually give us an answer of where the object is. And the second and I think most important one is actually to reason about the dynamic world, right? So we want to know where objects are going so that we can predict where they will go in the future. 
For example, this is super important for autonomous driving, right? You want to predict where the other cars or where the other people are going to go in the next few frames. Now, in the literature, tracking has been defined as many things. Correlation, finding correspondences between two frames, matching two frames, the famous data association. But I would say that tracking is mostly learning to model our target. And this means learning to model two qualities. First is the appearance and second is the motion. So the appearance is basically we want to understand how the object looks like from all angles, under all kinds of poses, this is especially important for people, for example. And so this is where subfields of tracking uh, are actively working on, like for example, single object tracking is based mostly on appearance or re-identification, which is a subfield of its own in computer vision. And the second thing that we want to model about an object is um, its motion, so that we can make those future predictions that I've been talking about. OK, so in the sequences that we usually deal with uh, for multi-object tracking, what kind of challenges are we facing? Well, we have multiple objects of the same type, first of all. So you can see here a scene that we classically target. And you can see many people moving around. You can see heavy occlusions, people, people occlusions, car, people occlusions. And also the appearance is often very similar between pedestrians. So there was this super famous sequence that is probably too old for any of you um, that we were working on ages ago, which was the PET sequence, it, which was filmed in a computer, uh, computer science campus. And everyone, absolutely everyone in that sequence was dressed in black. So using appearance models was completely useless because everyone looked exactly the same. So in this case, of course, you have a challenge because you cannot rely on appearance and you have to rely on other cues. Now, um, this type of completely crazy scene is what we're working on since 2020. So this is the kind of level that we want to work on. This is the type of scenes that we want to target with modern multiple object tracking techniques. So imagine, you know, annotating this sequence was a complete nightmare, uh, but tracking it is also not so easy. OK, so. The end of the of the introduction, I just want to introduce a couple more concepts. One is the difference between online and offline tracking. So you might have heard a lot about online tracking in which you want to track um, an object as, as as soon as the frame comes in. Right. So frame comes in, you track the object, new frame comes in, you continue tracking the object, you never look back and you never look forward. So this is great for real-time applications, for autonomous driving, for AR, VR. Of course, you need these real-time capabilities. But of course, it's prone to drifting, and it's really hard to recover from errors because you're looking at this very narrow time window, and you're not able to look into the future and not much in the past. Offline tracking, on the other hand, you can access the whole video. You can process a bunch of frames as large as usually your GPU allows. Um, and but it's great to recover from occlusions. Um, of course, it's not suitable for real time applications, but there are many other applications for offline tracking, uh, mostly, for example, for auto labeling, right? If you want to label your sequences for tracking, I really know that this is a complete pain. So having an automatic tool that labels most of your sequences is really useful. And this is usually done with offline tracking. Same for video editing or general video analysis. So today we'll talk about uh, some of the works that we did and that the community did in both online and offline tracking, mostly online tracking. So I will talk about Tractor, Center Track, and Trackformer, which are maybe the ones that I will talk about the most. Uh, and finally, one work that we recently submitted, which is called Ghost, which is the simplest tracker that you'll ever find. And with respect to offline tracking, I will just briefly mention tracking with graphical models and also with graph neural networks. So we'll talk about um, several paradigms in multi-object tracking, which reflect a little bit the evolution that the methods um, and that the people have followed through the years in, in computer vision, starting from the very simple tracking by detection, all the way to tracking by regression, tracking by attention, which 
as you uh, as you might have guessed, is actually using transformers for tracking. And so going from let's say separate tracking and detection, not much learning towards unifying both steps, unifying detection and tracking, and also towards end-to-end -to -end learning, right? So as we try to unify the two tasks, we also try to learn from images to tracks in one step. But there's a little surprise in the end. Um, the new method that I will talk about is actually one that goes back to the roots, goes back to tracking by detection, and actually shows the best performance of all. But this is kind of a spoiler for the end. Okay, so uh, most of the methods that I will present are evaluated on Mod Challenge, which is the benchmark that we launched in 2014. So this is the, the famous sequence that I was talking about, filmed in this computer science campus, in which, you know, like five, six people were walking around and people were going crazy to track them. When one was occluding the other, no tracker was working there. So these are the kind of sequences that we were dealing with just five, seven years ago. And as we launched more and more complex sequences, we got to this level that I was talking about before in 2020, we released uh, this benchmark with this kind of crowdness crazy uh, as a tracking problem, but this also allows us to see how much the community has evolved, right? From tackling these very simplistic sequences to tackling super complex sequences with hundreds of persons in the scene. Okay, so how did we get from here to there, basically? Let's start with the simplest tracker that you can have. Tracking by detection, this was a paradigm that was uh, prevalent up until 2018, maybe. And it used this great um, knowledge that we had in detectors, right? Because detectors uh, had evolved so much, they were now giving us really great um, output. So we really could have a great starting point where we said, look, there's three people in the scene, right? So now imagine going from the whole image to just these three locations. This is, of course, a simplification of the problem, right? Now, as a tracking person, the only thing I need to do is associate these detections in the temporal domain, connect the dots, basically. So, of course, there's things that you have to deal with, false positives, false negatives. This is everything, um, like all of these errors are things that you carry on into the data association. But, of course, it's much easier than to resolve because you have this great starting point, which is the detector. And of course, anything that um, all the improvements, improvements that we have on the detector side are improvements that we will carry on on the tracking side. So, okay, how does a very simple online tracker work in this case? You have your track initialization, which is using a detector. You then make a prediction. If you have a motion model because you have been tracking for a while, you can predict where the position is in the next frame. Otherwise, we will just take the prediction, um, the position at the first frame. <laughs> and then you have um, a step where the magic happens, right? The matching step. So this is the step where you say this box here corresponds to this other box here. And once you have made this association, you now have a trajectory. So this is the hardest step, of course. Um, with respect to the prediction, I don't want to talk too much about it, but a classic way of doing this is using a Kalman filter. Nowadays, one would use a recurrent architecture. You also have generative adversarial networks to predict the next position to do trajectory prediction. But to be honest, and this we will see in the last work, the best thing is constant velocity model. Simplest thing that you know we have been using since forever that is used everywhere in autonomous driving in the industry very simple to compute works usually the best but i don't want to talk about trajectory prediction today i want to focus in this matching step right so how does this work typically you have your detections at frame t and your detections at frame t plus one and now you have to associate them which means that you have to give a cost for this association, right? How likely it is that I'm gonna associate the red pedestrian at frame T with the red pedestrian at frame T plus one. So this you can define with any distance that you can think of. 
the actual pixel distance between boxes, 3D distance if you have a 3D sensor, um, intersection over union, re-identification score, whatever you want. Whatever you want, um, whatever you have that gives you a distance between the two boxes, you put it in there in this matrix. And then basically you solve the matching problem with the Hungarian algorithm, for example, any algorithm that you want that gives you um, this unique matching, you solve the problem and you find these assignments that actually minimize the cost uh, for the total matrix. So these assignments basically tell you which detections at frame T correspond to which detections at frame T plus one. So we are actually creating tracks by solving this matching problem. Okay, so now that I've presented you the simpler structure that you can have, um, you are you probably have studied a lot of deep learning, right? You're probably eager to listen about some networks and some trainings and so on. So we're like, okay, what is the role of deep learning in here, right? Um, for track initialization, basically for the detection step, this is obvious, right? We have um, faster CNN, we have YOLO X detectors, like all of these detectors, which are of course benefiting from deep learning from big amounts of data. So the better the model, the better our detection. So this is clear. But how about the next steps, right? Can we improve the next steps with some learning? So as far as um, the prediction of the next position, the motion model, um, you can actually use uh, complex networks, very complex networks, in order to predict the next position of pedestrians, in order to try to model the motion around objects, um, the motion, for example, how do people avoid each other? So you can basically add temporal complexity to the model with um, a deep learning method. For um, the appearance model, this is essentially adding feature complexity. Right, so I want to make my representation of one detection at frame T and one detection at frame T plus one richer so that I can do a better matching. And finally, also, um, you can solve the matching problem in a more complex way, adding computational complexity. So these are the kind of the three axes that I'm going to talk about today. So just so that you map actually these three axes with the actual works that people have been publishing in the computer vision community. Um, I made this nice plot of um, three benchmarks that we have in Mod Challenge, where on the X axis I plot the date, and on the Y axis the accuracy of the methods. And these are some of the methods that have been participating in the challenge. And we categorizing, we categorize them by the type of contribution that they claim to have in their paper. So what was the main idea of that paper in order to boost the accuracy of tracking methods? And so we see back in 2015, people were completely obsessed with motion models, me included, like had several papers of a social force model, learning um, um, the social force model from data and, and trying to make better uh, person predictions. And so this was basically working on adding this temporal complexity that I was talking about. Then came all the works with um, appearance model, trying to predict better appearances, trying to adapt the appearance as soon as the person moved across the scene and illumination, for example, changed. And finally, uh, computational complexity. So the ones where instead of solving just this bipartite matching with the Hungarian, they tried to blow up the problem and match, for example, across different frames, which is something I'm gonna talk about today. So let's start with the data association, just a very brief overview of what people did there. Um, so these are, mm, let's say most of the works are based on graphs for association. So they say, look, the bipartite matching that I was talking about before can actually be expressed as a graph problem but we can even blow it up more instead of just considering two frames, consider 10 frames, for example. So this is the classic case of offline tracking. And it's still, of course, tracking by detection because I need to have an initial set of detections to initiate my graph. So in this case, I'm going to have um, the input frames and my detections. And for each object detection, I'm gonna create a node in the graph. 
So now I have this graph with whatever connectivity I want, where the nodes represent the detections and where the trajectories inside the graph are going to represent the actual trajectories of the pedestrian. So wherever an edge is active between two nodes, it means that a match between two detections has been established. OK, so now the question is pretty much the same as we had for the Hungarian matching. We need to define what costs are we going to put in these edges. We need to define what consists of a good match versus the bad match. And so here we can do the same as we did for the Hungarian, some handcrafted features. We can even learn these features. And now once we have the cause of these edges defined, we just solve the optimization problem. Classic solver, for example, simplex, you solve for the task and you find your trajectories, which are essentially the connections between these nodes. So this is also like it is the simplest um, problem, right? Very few deep learning in there, I admit. And of course, there are several problems um, with, this with this approach. One is that um, the feature extraction, whatever features are put inside the edges, are completely independent from my optimization problem. So I could be putting features in there that don't lead to a great solution, and I will never know because these two steps are completely decoupled. And also the optimization can be very expensive, right? This depends a lot on the graph connectivity, but people started using Simplex, which is a linear program, then started creating quadratic programs, which take forever to solve, up to the point where people were submitting results to our benchmark that were computed over the span of 10 days, for example, which of course makes absolutely no sense. So we said, okay, what is the solution to these two problems? Well, finally, more machine learning, right? Let's try to, first of all, couple these steps of feature extraction and optimization, and let's try to find a faster solver. So instead of putting all our effort at test time in which the solver is expensive, we're gonna put it at train time, which is the classic paradigm of machine learning. So we had this nice graph structure. So in order to work on the graph structure and perform learning there, we need a graph neural network, so no surprise there. Um, we're going to put in the node some information that is coming from the image, right? Because each node represents a detection. So what we do is basically we have these tiny CNNs that are going to extract information from the detections and just put it in the node. Just a tiny embedding, 128 values will suffice. Then we say, okay, um, we still need the edge embeddings, right? We need to put some information on the edges. Before, this information was, for example, the distance between two boxes. So now we're going to put, you know, any information that you want about position, box size, anything that you want. We concatenate it, MLP, and the network will decide. So now the idea is that we have this graph neural network that takes all of this information, node information, edge information, does some message passing steps, and finally gives you a result, which is, is this edge connecting to detections or not? Right, so it's a very basic classification problem, one or zero, in which the edges are either active or not active. And active means that, of course, two detections are being connected and they're forming a trajectory. So once you have um, basically, um, you do a forward pass, you classify all these edges into yes or no, and this gives you the trajectory. There is a small projection step, uh, which I can talk about if there's if there's interest, because it could be that the solution that the solver gives you is not 100% uh, satisfying the constraints of the connectivity. Just to put it simply, it's possible that one detection is connected to two detections in future frames. So we do need to project to the manifold of, um, of correct solutions, but this is usually very simple and very easy to do. Okay, so what is the great advantage of actually using graph neural networks over the classic solver that we have? Well, first is that these steps of feature extraction and data association are now both done with a machine learning pipeline, which means that I can back propagate through it. So I've just coupled these two problems so that now the 
features that I'm going to extract are specifically targeted at solving the problem. So they are much, much better than any feature that I can learn separately, or of course, any feature that I can imagine myself and just hand prep. And the other advantage is that I don't need the expensive optimization at test time, right? So predicting trajectories just means a forward pass through my graph neural network. Okay, so um, this was still tracking by detection, right? The first paradigm that I wanted to introduce most common paradigm until three years ago, I would say. And it can be done online, which is the first simple tracker that I talked about, or by batches, which is with a graph formulation, or solved with a graph neural network. Of course, the bad thing is that we still need the detections to compute the graph. So even though I've already coupled two steps, feature extraction and the solver, I still don't do fully end to end, right? There's still this step of extracting the detections. And of course, the detections might not be optimal for the tracking process. So I still, I still have some way to go towards end to end learning. So let's move then to the next paradigm. So the next paradigm is going to be tracking by regression. Um, this was first uh, published, I would say, in 2019, 2020. People started working on tracking by regression after realizing that there is so much more that you can get from your average detector. So let's go back to, by now, like super old uh, regression-based detectors like faster CNN or faster CNN, in which you have your input image, you pass this image through a series of convolutions. This might as well be a transformer network. I don't care. Everything that I need is a feature representation of this image. And then in these uh, faster CNN type of detectors, you had what they call region proposals, which is kind of a way of saying, you know, let's not analyze the whole image. Let's just focus on this region where there is a lot of potential that there is actually an object of interest. And this region proposal, of course, has its own feature representation. And from this, I can predict several things. I can classify this region proposal is this a person? Is this a car? Is this background? But there is something even more interesting, which is the regression head, right? So the regression head has uh, quite an interesting goal of saying, if my region proposal is not perfectly aligned with the object, I'm going to the regress it so that it tightly fits the object. And there's, you know, as minimum, uh, as little background as possible. And the object is all inside the box. And, you know, this was merely done to improve um, accuracy in the benchmarks because actually having a tightly fit box affects your accuracy. So people kind of hack this around. But for tracking, this is super interesting, right? So back, you know, in 2019, we thought, OK, this behavior of actually moving the box a little bit so that it tightly fits the object is very, very similar to what we want to do in online tracking, right? Where you have an object that is walking around. You have a box at frame T. At frame T plus one, the object has moved a little bit. And ideally, you would like the box to move with the object frame by frame. And we thought, this is exactly what this regression head is doing, right? So why not using this detector for tracking? And this is why we called our method tractor, which was essentially a method trained for detection, but with tracking capabilities. And so how we used it is actually, um, let's imagine that we're at frame T plus one, and we have the detections of frame T, we use them as our proposals, right? So you have to get into the mentality that we are using now a detector, so we need something called region proposals. So we go back to frame T and we say, okay, here are the proposals. Of course, the objects have moved a little bit. You see that the boxes are not perfectly aligned because the pedestrian is walking towards an, some direction. But this is why bounding box regression is for, right? You just use your regression head with these proposals, and bam, you have a new bounding box. And now you're like, Laura, wait, I mean, this is not really tracking, right? I mean, you just move this box, but have you really performed this association step that you were talking about before? Well, in order to know whether we actually did tracking or not, we have to answer this very simple question, right? So 
If I look, for example, at um, detection with ID1, which is the red box, right? Let's consider that this is the pedestrian that I have been tracking for a while. Now I say, do I know where the red box is going in the next frame? And I'm like, sure. I mean, the red box in the next frame is here. I mean, it's colored in red, right? It's not the blue box, it's not the green box, but from the red box proposal, I regress this position. So by this, I've made an implicit association, which means that I actually did track this box from one frame to the next. Now, of course, this is a super simple tracker, and there are many problems with this tracker that one can solve with motion model, re-identification heads, and the like. But there's also a lot of advantages, right? Like, first of all, you don't even have to train your tracker. Your tracker is a super well-trained detector. There's nothing that you need to do, and it works out of the box. Um, you can also, if you want, if you need to retrain your detector, you can train it on still images. If you do, for example, cell tracking, and you're annotating your videos super tediously to track those cells, you don't need to do that. You just need to annotate images. And finally, um, it is an online method, right? So you can use it for your autonomous vehicle that needs to track objects in real time. And it turns out that we're not the only ones to think that way. So um, there's a couple of works. One is Tractor, and the, most notably the other one is Center Track. They both have this concept of tracking by regression. Just that Tractor regresses bounding boxes and Center Track regresses center points for the object. But the idea is pretty much the same, right? To exploit these um, regression properties of detectors. And it is a step forward towards merging tracking and detection in a weird way, but it is a step forward. The only problem here is that there is an overwhelming power of the spatial cues and the appearance cues are left kind of on the side. So if you think how tractor works, if there are two objects that are just you know, crossing by classic tracking problem. Tractor is going to have a problem with that because it's just going to snap the box to any person that is walking around the area, right? It has no notion of identity. And it's pretty much the same with center track, right? <laughs> but still, like, um, these type of tracking by regression methods took um, the community and, and all the benchmarks and produce really outstanding results. So all these uh, blue stars that just appear here are methods based on tracking by regression. So you see that they have really uh, an overwhelming power, mostly because they are able to leverage a lot of data. They are pure uh, learning methods. And so they really had a much better accuracy than state of the art at the time. Okay, so now it's like, okay, we have used a detector for tracking, so we've taken one step forward um, in the in this unification of the two tasks. But let's take the final step. Let's go towards really unifying the two tasks and towards not only relying on spatial cues, but also trying to put some of the appearance in there. So there are several options. Uh, one option is actually um, to do joint detection and association. So basically, um, the same as I have explained before, but now instead of having the classification head and the regression head, I'm going to have another head, which is called the embedding head, which is basically your good old re-identification head. So just an embedding that represents the appearance of that particular object that you're tracking. So you can imagine then at test time, you will have several embeddings and you will just compute uh, an L2 distance and say, okay, these boxes belong together. Um, so all the power of the association lies into this embedding, right? It's not in the regression head anymore, but it's in the embedding. Of course, there are several problems with this. There's um, the fact that the actual association step is still quite heuristic. Um, the good thing, though, is that it's near, re near real time because you have just one backbone. So with a forward pass, you do everything. And... It's nice that you're actually training detection and tracking together, but the two tasks are still handled by two separate heads. And so we saw that there's actually not much real communication between the two. Now, the same thing can be extended um, 
to an anchor free method, which is based on CenterNet. So essentially you take CenterNet, you put this embedding head and you have uh, what is called Fairmot, which was a tracker that was very popular at its time because it worked actually really, really well. And that's basically option one, right? You take your detector, you add this association head, and this is, uh, this is how you get tracking. But today I'm gonna talk mostly about option two, which I think is more fun. And that is the option of actually using what we all want to use these days, which is attention or transformers. Um, so how many of you have actually used transformers sometime in their life? Okay, how many have actually trained a transformer on their own with their own hands? Okay, okay. So you know how painful it is, right? So I'm gonna talk about this work, which is amazing, tracking by attention, but it took forever to make it work. Training this transformer was a complete pain. So I love this work, it's a really neat formulation, but it's not your average, oh yeah, I have a master thesis, let's try this thing, train it from scratch, like no way. Um, so, okay, this, this work was inspired by uh, Detter, which is a famous um, detector that appeared that said, look, I'm gonna do detection with transformers. And so I will not go too much into detail, but the idea was that you had um, your backbone, which was still a CNN. So you were processing your image with a CNN and you were taking your feature vector and passing it through two uh, transformers. One was the encoder and the other one was the decoder. So the encoder was basically grabbing all this image information, positional encoding, and trying to make some sense of it, while the decoder was doing all the detection magic. And what it was basically doing was it was transforming what they call object queries, which were essentially random vectors at the beginning, and they were transforming them into bounding boxes. So magically these queries, together with some image information that was coming with uh, from the encoder, was being transformed into actual bounding box coordinates plus you know, classification value, whatever you want to predict in there. So this was a super neat formulation, right? Because now all of the uh, non-maximum suppression, which I haven't talked about, but if there's anyone working on detection and tracking, you will know that there's some super painful, super heuristic step called non-maximum suppression which completely disappeared uh, when we're talking about Detter because all the magic was being done by this transformer decoder. So you no longer had to um, disambiguate between different boxes that were being predicted on a same object. So once we had um, this, uh, this detector with transformers, we thought, okay, it is actually super easy to extend this to sequences, right? So if detection was put as a set prediction problem by transformers, now what we did was we had a set prediction problem that was acting on a frame by frame basis. So on the first frame, you start with your average debtor. So there's uh, no change from debtor. This is what debtor does in the, in the first step. But in the second step, what we do is actually, uh, we want to start making this association step, right? So we need to have a sort of communication between frame zero and frame one. And the communication happens with this, uh, what we call autoregressive track queries. So instead of having now only the object queries, we're going to have something that is called track queries. And we hope that in these track queries, we have all the information that is needed to actually track an object. So we have the motion model embedded in there. We have the appearance model embedded in there. Everything has to be stored inside this vector. And so we can just do this frame by frame, right? This is an online tracking method. And we can track an object by having these object queries for new objects that are appearing and track queries for objects that are already in the scene. So let's see a little bit more in detail how uh, the transformers actually work and specifically what each type of attention is going to do for our tracking problem. So um, the encoder is going to be exactly the same as we had before, right? It takes the image features with the self-attention and it just processes them a little bit. 
We then have the decoder, which takes the object queries and the track queries, as I've said. You just concatenate these queries, so there's uh, no magic happening there. We just want to treat them equally. And then you have a series of self-attention and encoder-decoder uh, attention steps. And this is going to be where we're going to have all this communication between the new objects appearing, the objects that we actually want to track, and all the information that is coming from the image. And finally, of course, you're going to have the mapping of the queries to box and class predictions. So this is the same as with the data. So let's look at now into this attention and what kind of ingredients are doing what we want them to do for the tracking problem specifically. So we have these two types of attention that I've mentioned, right? One is the self-attention between queries. And the other is the encoder-decoder attention, the communication between the image and the queries. Now, the first one, intuitively, you think, if I have to initialize a new track, if I see a part of the image that potentially contains an object, but no track query wants to track that object because it says, no, I've never seen this object before, you want to initialize it with an object query, right? You want to have an object query that takes responsibility for producing a box. But first, you have to look that the track queries don't want to take over that box, which means that there has to be this communication between the object queries and the track queries. So this is where this self-attention is actually helping out a lot. The same goes for terminating an occluded track, right? If there's a pedestrian walking around and suddenly becomes occluded, I need to terminate it. So I need to look over all the image and I need all the track queries and the object queries to agree that this object has disappeared. So again, this communication is helpful. What about the encoder-decoder attention? Well, this is, of course, to find new objects in the frame, right? There's a new object that appears. I have some features that tell me that there's an object here. I need to communicate this to my queries. But most importantly, you actually need to adjust to a change position of the tracks, right? The track has moved. I need to go to the image. I need some image evidence that tells me where this track is now. And if you have actually worked with better, you will know that um, the queries actually have some spatial information embedded with it. And so you have this sort of um, prior that a query, um, that a certain query will predict boxes on the bottom left of the image, for example. But now you have this track that is moving around, right? And so your query needs to be updated to the new position of the track. So it cannot be like a static query like uh, the object query is, but needs to move around both in appearance as well as in uh, the spatial location in the image. Okay, so um, let's let's look at, for example, the problem of occlusions, right? Like in all of this formulation that I've uh, explained, um, can I actually recover from occlusions? Because if not, then this tracker is quite limited, right? But it is actually super easy to recover from occlusions you just need to keep the track queries active for a certain time window. Even if they don't produce a box, you still keep them active, right? You still allow them to produce a box for a certain time window. And this is where a bit of the heuristics comes in and how you train this thing. It is not super easy um, to, for example, in an occlusion of 100 frames, uh, make this same track query to predict the correct box so I have uh, my pedestrian that is walking around and is occluded for a long time, 100 frames, and then reappears somewhere else. So as I've said, the query has this notion of a location in the image, and it has seen the pedestrian in this location. If now suddenly it appears here, it is very hard that it's going to say, oh yeah, this is my pedestrian, right? So training Trackformer to do this is actually really hard, and we didn't really manage um, to get re-identification for long time windows and especially for long spatial, um, basically when the pedestrian has moved a lot of pixels. So this, this is actually super hard and there's very few data to train for this. Um, the, cool, the other cool thing is that there's no need for an extra re-ID head. So if you look at most of the trackers, they have this extra re-ID head to boost performance. The bad thing is, um, as I've said, that there's this spatial information embedded into the track query, 
and this doesn't really allow us to do long term reidentification. OK, um, so since I have talked a lot about this, I will um, like not talk about some of the details on how you train this track former. Um, but I think it's it's still a super elegant formulation, so it naturally merges detection and tracking in one uh, single step. It actually has really good performance on partial occlusions. It has good performance where detectors are weak because if you don't have much image evidence that there is an object in there, but you do have all the history of where the object has been embedded in this trap query, it's much easier to then make this query predict the box in that location. And at the time it had like by far state of the art results, as I said, super hard to train, it needs a lot of extra data and there's a lot of tricks to train it. Um, and I have to say, like, we're not the, the only method to do this, right? So there were a couple of concurrent papers, Mimot and Motor, um, that both appear roughly at the same time. And they're, they're actually doing very similar things. They also have the concept of track queries. So I think the whole community was thinking in this direction. OK, so that's the good thing about Trackformer, but um, there's also a bad aspect to it, right? And I, I used to finish the presentation here, right? Oh, like attention is great, right? Uh, but now CVPR came, <laughs> we had to produce something better, right? Um, so um, we, did, we did figure out that, uh, first of all, training this model is not straightforward. But the thing that I really don't like is that it requires a lot of data, right? So this thing trained on mod challenge alone, it's not really uh, it's not really working. Even if pre-trained on ImageNet, Coco, everything that you can imagine, it still requires pre-training on crowd human, which is this great data set for detection. And you can actually train this method by just perturbing the images and creating a fake tracking. So this is great, right? You can train it on detection data, but you do need a lot of it. And it is unclear, or I would rather say the methods do not really generalize. So, for example, if you don't see any mod challenge data, your performance goes down quite a lot. If you try to then track another very different um, scenario, then the method doesn't really work. So this is something that was quite not sitting right with us. So we thought, OK, can we actually get a tracker that generalizes to diverse tracking conditions that does not require vast amount of training data? And it turns out um, that the answer was where we began all along in tracking by detection. So this is the first tracker that I talked about, the simple online tracker. So now let me tell you in just a couple of slides how to make this tracker state of the art by far on four different benchmarks. So we're not talking about more challenge anymore, but actually four different benchmarks. So the whole magic, of course, happens inside how you define these distances, right? This is where all the magic happens because the bipartite matching, this is an optimization problem. You're not going to do much there. But whatever information you put in there is the key towards deciding which detections are associated to which other detections. And so it turns out that in order to make this state of the art, we need to pay a lot of attention to three key details. Um, so this is just a reformulation or, or re, um, a new graphic on um, the simple online tracker that I was talking about before. So you're going to have your detections. You're going to process them with whatever backbone um, you like the most. And then um, you're going to have, first of all, very simple constant velocity model. So we're not trying to do anything fancy here, just constant velocity model. And you're going to have these re-identification values, right? The re-identification network that everyone uses that compares the appearance between two bonding boxes. We're actually going to spice up um, this part a little bit. And the three parts that I said that you need to pay attention to details um, are actually this uh, feature extraction, how you do the feature extraction from the detections, how you represent the appearance of these detections, the fact that you do have a concept of active and inactive tracks, 
By active, I mean the tracks that you are tracking at the time in an online manner. And by inactive, I mean all the tracks that are occluded and that you hope to find in some future frame. It turns out that these two have to be treated in completely different ways. And finally, of course, also how you put everything together. And with this, we created um, the tracker GHOST, which stands for good old Hungarian simple tracker. Now, if you pay attention, you will see that the order of the words is not really the order of the acronym, but, you know, having something. Well, okay, are, are you okay? I don't know if this ambulance is for, for the person or, or what happened there. Okay. Um, well, I, I hope they have, I know the ghost is scary, but come on. Uh, so, um, so yeah, let's see, let's see what this tracker, um, or rather what these three ingredients are about. Um, so just for, for time constraints, I'm going to talk about these two, which I think are the most important ones. And they're actually super simple observations that I think the community already knows, but nobody really put it. Um, down the numbers and did the proper analysis to see that this is actually very important for tracking. So the first one is that um, ReID networks are typically trained on ReID datasets, and these are datasets specifically designed for the ReID problem. They have pedestrians from different viewpoints, different illumination conditions, but they really don't translate to multi-object tracking. So here you see um, we have a plot of different ReID methods for the, um, and we plot the ReID metric on the x-axis and the IDF1 metric on the y-axis, which is one of the main um, MOT metrics for um, data association, which tells you basically whether you associated um, the tracks correctly or not, how you kept um, these identities consistent across the frames. And so you see basically that all of these super high re-identification networks that work really well for re-ID, they actually have quite a poor performance on multi-object tracking, right? And so essentially um, the question is, okay, how do you go from there to up here on this method, which is our method, in which we don't really care how we perform on re-ID, but we want to perform really good association on uh, multi-object tracking data sets. So um, the solution is actually to adapt this reading network, which you have trained already, just adapt it to the multi-object tracking statistics, right? So there's a lot of words on how to adapt networks, um, on how to, without retraining, adapt them to a new sequence, uh, new illumination conditions. And it's usually by re-weighting re the batch normalization layers. And so this is exactly what we do, right? We take the mean and variance of the features obtained from the detections of the current frame, and we use them to re-weight the batch normalization layers. That's it, right? We're not retraining any network. We're not training it with mod data. We're just re-weighting because what we saw was the, the statistics coming from these ReID uh, data sets were completely different to the mod data set. And this reweighting actually did the trick to adapt to these new conditions. So that's one trick, super easy, has been done since forever. Um, the other trick is actually how you treat the active and inactive tracks, right? So if you have, I don't know, you're tracking 10 pedestrians and you're seeing them frame by frame, but you have in your memory bank, 10 other pedestrians that have disappeared at some point in the sequence, and you still hope to find them in future frames. Now, the question is, if we treat these two sets in the same way, you're going to have a lot of confusion of identities. And so we did a bit of an analysis to actually find out why. And so what I'm showing here is in pink, we have distributions for active tracks and in yellow, inactive tracks. So let's look at the light pink which is this distribution on the left, left um, which is the real distance between two boxes with the same ID. So ideally, this should be all the way to zero, right? Two boxes that represent the same ID should have 
the exact same feature vector, right? This is just L2 distance of READ feature vectors. So ideally, you want this pushed all the way to zero as much as you can. On the other side, you have um, the dark pink, which is actually behind the dark yellow, so you cannot see it too much, which is the READ distance between two boxes with different IDs, right? So you have an active track, and you look at all the boxes, and you compute the L2 distance with the feature vector of all the boxes that are not the ones with your same ID. And of course, this should be as much pushed towards one as possible. So this is great, right? I mean, you have two distributions, they are quite separate. So if I just use simple thresholding, I'm going to be able to separate these two quite well. So I'm going to be able to do the matching only with a simple thresholding. So this means that my really features work really well for active cases. For inactive tracks, though, this is another story, right? So you have the dark yellow, which is basically very similar to the dark pink, but with a slightly longer tail to the left. But then you have this bright yellow. This bright yellow that is all over the place in the middle is the read distance between two boxes with the same ID when these boxes are inactive, which means that there is an occlusion, suddenly the box reappears somewhere else, and now I'm comparing these two distances. So this means that it's super hard to associate boxes when they are far apart in time. Potentially, there has been some pose changes, illumination changes. Um, the, the box is far away in the image, so using also a motion model is, is hard. So these are the tough cases, right? And so you see that if actually I use the thresholding for the active and the inactive classes, not only I'm going to have a hard time with inactive classes, but I also have to pick two different thresholds for the active and inactive classes. And this was usually done kind of ad hoc. So, you know, people tuning the parameters, overfitting to the mod challenge test set, which a lot of people are doing, and we're kind of like trying to find out who that is. Um, but, you know, before doing that, maybe just take a look at your distributions and find thresholds that come from data. So that's one thing, like having a way to find uh, the matching thresholds from the data. And the other thing that we need to fix is this mess that is happening here with inactive tracks, right? So inactive tracks, even if you threshold it, it's really hard to separate them. And so um, what we basically do is we come up with um, a way to compute a proxy from the inactive track that it's not only the appearance of the last box, but an average appearance between different boxes. And we actually have a way of explaining how um, this can be best done so that we can now push a little bit more the distribution to be a little bit separate um, so that the yellow distribution goes to the left and it can be separated a little bit easier from the dark yellow distribution. So basically, um, we have this super simple tracker, which is a frame by frame tracker, super fast. Um, we actually do not train it on any tracking sequence. So this tracker has never seen any of these tracking sequences. We take more challenge training sequence and we just forget about it. And it actually generalizes to four benchmarks, which is really cool, right? I mean, you have these crazy, bench, uh, crazy benchmarks, you have more challenge, you have BDD, dense track, and we actually generalize to all of these without seeing ever any tracking sequence at train time. So I think this is really cool. Um, it's a very simple tracker. We, I, I have to say, like, probably the devil is in the details. But I mean, we are state of the art, right? Which is actually quite impressive because obtaining a general tracker that has not been trained on any uh, of the training sequences, being fast, being super simple is something that can actually be useful for real time applications. OK, so um, this is the end of my talk. I just want to summarize a little bit um, all the paradigms that we saw in this talk. So we started with tracking by detection, whether that is online tracker, tracking with a simple Hungarian tracker or offline tracking methods. We then moved to tracking by detection, which basically showed the power of spatial cues and how a detector can be turned into a tracker. Um, then we went into tracking by attention, in which we actually merged 
the two tasks of detection and tracking with an end-to-end -end formulation with transformers. Very nice, but it's hard to train, requires a lot of data. And finally, um, I went back to the beginning and presented another tracking by detection uh, method that is super simple, but it actually works really well if you pay attention to the little details that actually make it generalized. So with this, I want to thank all my collaborators, especially uh, my students at TUM. And thank you all very much for your attention. And if you have any questions online or on site, I will be happy to answer them.